All right, guys. All right. Welcome back. Before we start the video, check out these awesome Power 9 Unlimiteds. Different variety of cards, beta duels, all on no reserve eBay auction right now. And look at this. Black label. No reserve, guys. Look at these cards. Tabernacle. Survival Fittest. Oh, this card, by the way, would be auctioned later on. Look at this card. Hermit Druid. And Alpha. Alpha Land Island. Wow. All right, guys. All eBay auction. No reserve. Don't miss out. 10-day auctions. Bid early. Enjoy the video. Vintage Magic. Game. Collect. Invest. For more information about our consulting and professional services, visit VintageMagic.com. All right, guys, welcome back. All right, so uh, a lot of you guys have asked about match to gathering art and collectibles and where and how does this all work out. So I want to do a little bit of a more of an advanced topic about where the collectible market for artwork is going to head. Now, for those of you who don't understand how uh, what match to gathering cards are, and you know, because a lot of you guys may come like the digital side of magic. The original artwork from Magic the Gathering kind of looked like this. This is the Riven Turnbull uh, Legends card by Richard Kane Ferguson. Is the original art. And um, it was done in watercolor, I believe. And uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful piece. Not a really seriously powerful card. It was a gold Legends card. But it was just a very iconic piece for some collectors. And the cards back in the day were all... Uh, original artwork and because the scanners back in 1993-94 were really really expensive uh, the scanners were like four grand five grand for a scanner you go to you know Home Depot or I'm sorry uh, Staples today or, or Office Max the Epson scanner a really nice one it could cost you 300 bucks a really really high powered one back in the day they didn't have that so the art had to be really small and the art for this one is about five inches by seven inches, so super small. And the alpha pieces were kind of like that also. Now, artwork has gotten bigger over the years. There's pieces that are much, much larger. Um, and some artists usually only work in larger sizes. And we're talking like anywhere from 8 by 10, 9 by 12, 11 by 14, and even new pieces. This is where it gets crazier is that the pieces now that are newer are in the range of like 36 by 48, the huge pieces, right? Uh, Chris Ronda, some mega large pieces, um, and especially the iconic pieces. There's been a lot of reprints of iconic cards, and of course, you know, Force of Will reprinted. I think Scott Fisher had a really cool Force of Will, Will take, and that piece was really large. So you'll see a lot of pieces like that. Now, I want to talk more also now about like, where is the market heading for these art pieces? Because when someone buys someone like something like this, either from an artist, the MTG art market, eBay, whatever, right? At, a, at an art show, uh, the Magic Cons, etc. There's this um, kind of like one of one approach where once it's gone, it's you'll never see it again, and it could be someone's home for years, or it could be sold the next week due to financial reasons. There's a lot of different things that happen. And a lot of people try to search for their grail. And what I mean by grail is that their favorite card, their favorite uh, collectible, etc. And art, that's just the case. The thing is, keep in mind, all of the older vintage magic art is going to be in the, high, the five figure range already. I, I don't see any older magic art really uh, ever going to be in that $1,000 range. Obviously, you might see some stragglers hitting, you know, three to four thousand uh, dollars. Maybe a Fallen Empires piece, I guess that that was from 1994. But it really, one day, I could foresee all of it becoming a five figures, ten thousand dollar minimum, and then uh, soar higher from there. You know, pieces like from Arabian Nights, which were super uh, small set, right? I think there was like 78 cards, something like that, and. Even though there were variations, there's only 78 pieces. 
And by owning an Arabian Nights piece, you own one of 78, technically, of the set. And I think the minimum, there's a minimum floor price for something like that. It's going to be in the multi-five figures, regardless of the image. All right, so a lot of you guys have asked me, well, why does the art, why is this piece, for example, this piece, uh, worth what it is? Uh, this piece, uh, I won't tell you the exact price, but it's sold for a multi-five figures. Why would someone buy this for multiple five figures? All right, so, and especially the card isn't really valuable. Why? Well, it goes by a lot of factors. I may have talked about this before, but let's review that. Number one, you have the artist. Richard Kane Ferguson is one of the most uh, legendary artists of uh, Magic the Gathering. He's a vintage artist from the 93-94 era. He still does art today, which is uh, a uniquely different style in some ways, uh, different medium maybe. But the style he had before was very detailed. Uh, very, I don't know, very, look at that, super, the watercolor just pops out very, kind of a, cloudy feel right kind of vintagey look i just i really admire that look some people don't gotta keep that in mind so that leads to the second thing is preference some people have a preference in image they might have a pet favorite type of cars like vampires sarah uh, angels uh you know goblins whatever right everybody has their own style of art Another thing is size. Some people are really picky about the size of the art. The Force of Will, for example, by Therese Nielsen, uh, is the most recent sale of a high-end piece publicly for $350,000 by Heritage Auctions recently, this year. Uh, that's the original Force of Will. Um, that piece, size-wise, I believe was approximately, I want to say... A little bit under 9 by 12, I would say, right? So decent size compared to the 5 inch by 7 inch uh, alpha pieces and legends pieces, the dark, etc., right? Expansion sets. So people might value it differently. Um, but let's be honest. If the Force of Will was like some mega huge, huge piece, like massive piece on the wall of a guy that looks like Wolverine and stuff, I don't know if that, that might detract from the, the value to some people, right? Now, obviously, why is the Forest of Will so valuable? Well, let's talk about why. Because it is iconic. Iconic pretty much plays a significant role of the valuations. Like the Black Lotus painting we sold in 2022 for four million dollars, that's obviously the most iconic piece of all time of Magic the Gathering, the original artwork for Black Lotus by Christopher Rush. Um, it is just, you know, it's it's super S tier, right? Higher than S tier in some way. Power nine, dual lands, those are super high tiers too. So you have levels of that. And Force of Will, obviously being the, one of the most played blue cards ever in the game, not a super valuable card, but uh, played it. Um, people have played these that card in their decks or have seen that card used so many times. It's engraved in them. And the next thing is nostalgia. So nostalgia with the Force of Will is so massive. Everybody in Magic knows about Force of Will. Everybody knows about Black Lotus. You may play new Magic today. You might be a kid watching this and I'm dead. You'll know about Force of Will. you probably seen it reprinted like multiple times now. I don't know, 50 times by now. I don't know if you're watching this video and it's, you know, 2,500 AD. I don't know. Probably printed like 10,000 times. I don't know. Regardless, Force of Will is so iconic. It transcends so many different things. That includes, you know, the Black Lotus, the Power Nine, the Dual Lands. Uh, so Shivan Dragon is in that category. Vesuvan Doppelganger to some people, right? Now, what is iconic? Now, iconic is based off eras in some way. Some of you guys, some of you collectors, he or she, right, would value some of the newer newer cards the newer cards like jace the mind sculptor is relatively new the one from world wake that is super iconic super iconic for the game everybody knows jace the mind sculptor if you play magic in some ways and that card has been repitted in some fashion but never in a different image it's always by 
Uh, gosh, what is that artist's name? Okay, well, it's slipping off the tip of my tongue, but super famous. Oh, Jason Chan. Sorry. Sorry, Jason. I don't think that card has ever been actually redone in a different image. Now, think about it. Uh, as of filming this video, uh, 2024, yeah. And I don't know if they ever will. Will they? I think they will. You might as well. That variation of a Jace the Mind Sculptor would probably be pretty crazy, right? Pretty crazy. And value-wise, for an original art, because Jace the Mind Sculptor was digital. And that leads me to the second point I'm going to make is, is it digital or is it original? Like a watercolor piece, oil piece, acrylic, whatever. Can Or can you just buy prints of Jace the Mind Sculptor? And Jason Mind Sculptor is unfortunately just one of those things. It's a digital piece. Now, there are pieces that are pencil sketches that have been then digitalized and such. There are originals of the pencil sketches. Some have like color studies, uh, meaning like there's color palettes and stuff of different paintings, but there's no actual finished original one of one painting. So, Keep that in mind. There are value to that world, right? There are paintings that have done that. Um, there's also a thing called replicas, where people buy what you call repaints or replicas, which are really just a, a artist's interpretation of that moment in time when they redid that painting, like the Underground Sea, or or there's a Black Lotus, or it could be a Jason Mind sculptor. Uh, even, you know, let's say Jason wanted to do some replica paintings of it, right? They look similar to the original, but they're obviously not the original, right? So that has happened before, and there's value and collectability in that. Um, then you have, I'm not going to talk about artist proofs today much, but there's obviously artist proofs are a piece of artwork, especially when they are painted, sketched on the back. The artist proofs were given to the artist. Uh, there's about 50 of them or so given to the artists back in the day. And now, as of today, you know, they give them as a collectible or a way to put additional artwork on the back of the cards. And these artworks are super collectible and very valuable in many cases. In some cases, uh, represent, you know, a lot of these digital artists, the only time they actually produced artwork on the card. So, a lot of these artists, like um, I think, like Steve Argyle, for example, uh, Eric Deschamps, uh, Jason Chan, right? Some of these guys did a lot of mostly digital art in the beginning of their career, and they essentially uh, now these artist proofs, and they can paint on the back. The values of those can be so valuable, right? Because they rarely uh, they, they don't do it traditionally. So I think I hit. Most of the factors of why people are collecting them. Let me adjust this a little bit. It's like so freaking bright. Oh, a second. I, uh, I've hit m most of the factors, but I want to end it like this. Um, if you're looking for collectibles and art and you're wanting to buy into it, um, I always say that the most important thing is to have fun. A lot of people tend to do it as a business or some type of like, you know, what's the value to me, you know, like, you know, they kind of put like a price tag on it and they just kind of overdo the analyzation and there's no problem with that as a magic gathering collector. You have the right to do whatever you want, but if you start doing it as too much as an evaluation, an assessment of like, there's so many statistics involved, right? There needs to be like a passion for the art. Because ultimately, I say buy the art because you appreciate the art. Don't buy it because you want to make some money. I don't know if that makes any sense, right? Don't Art is unique that way. Don't buy it because you just want to flip it. Um, now, granted, you know, if you're brokering a deal for someone who wants to buy it, um, you, you found a buyer and you flip it, that's not a bad thing. I'm just saying that in general, if you're looking to collect, buy something you really are going to appreciate and love. Uh, get to know the artists. I've, you know, my career of collecting magic has been so long. I've been doing this since the beginning of my career of magic, um, uh, especially when I'm in my older years, especially. And um, I've had 
some of the best memories, best experiences, best tales of just crazy stories of these, with these artists. I've had the privilege to work with some of the credible fantasy artists of the, you know, this, it's crazy. Like I, as I get older, I'm going to tell my kids more tales of these amazing artists and people that I've met over the years. Uh, as I've grown up, it's been harder to travel and see the artists and do more stuff, but I always try to pop in and do some a conversation if I can. Um, they were the ones that supported me in my business early on in my career, a lot of these guys, and I was fortunate enough to uh, you know, do a lot of uh, great, you know, just great things with them, you know, and I think that was just some of the greatest memories I've ever had in my career. So if you uh, appreciate art, I say, why don't you just go for it in the full effect, you know? Um, if you appreciate the game, you, you know, you sleeve your decks up, you have them signed by the artist, you can alter, you collect prints, and, you know, maybe buy some originals, you know? Some originals. You never know what an artist will have. Ask them. A lot of the old ones have been sold, obviously, but the artists are really kind in general to uh, share their time. All right, guys. Well, I hope you guys got something out of it. I... Uh, I think it's a fascinating subject. I, I've got a lot of details here. If you have any questions at all, I'm going to have some incredible pieces of artwork uh, available uh, the next this whole entire year. If you want to be a part of this type of offering, you can call me, text me, call me below. And um, yeah, I want to hear more about your thoughts on the Force of Wales sale. Uh, for $350,000. I might go into more depth breakdown of my thoughts of that sale in the future, but I wanted to kind of put that, this whole thing as in a broader view of Magic the Gathering art. All right, guys, take care. Happy collecting. Stay safe out there. Take care. Hey, everyone. It's me, Daniel, with VintageMagic.com. I want to share with you more about how we handle consignments. So to begin the consignment process, we actually need to start with the consultation service. In this consultation, I will determine what you're looking to do. And generally, consigners usually tell me, hey, Dan, I'm looking to sell my items and maximize the value of their collection. After we determine through the consultation, I usually like to do an appraisal process. And an appraisal process in terms of a consignment is more fitted towards authenticity and valuation for current market values. From there, after a contract is crafted and signed, we will then receive the items from you. The reason why our consignment process is very thorough is we also identify cards that could be graded so then they can maximize higher dollar values. So the payment process is very simple. Once we have sold your items, you'll get an updated ledger and we will process payment um, for whatever form of payment you need. As a consigner, you're gonna experience our white glove service. What that means is I'm gonna personally handle your collectibles from beginning to end. And rest assured, the client that purchases your collectibles will also receive the same white glove service. It's a signature service that I really pride myself on in working closely with my clients. Vintage Magic. Game. Collect. Invest. For more information about our consulting and professional services, visit VintageMagic.com.